that um, through some of our social channels later. Great. So for those of you uh, who do not know me, I'm Dr. Robin Waite, the Policy and Advocacy Manager for Results Canada, and I'm also the Secretariat of the Stop TV Canada Network. Great to see you all here. Um, I will ask if you aren't speaking, please do mute yourself. Um, or if you are a co-host, please go around and mute people who are unmuted. Okay, great. So let's just dive into a bit of housekeeping. Um, I know none of us are new to Zoom, but there are some tips and tricks to consider for this session. Uh, firstly, it is always really lovely to see human faces. So if you're comfortable doing so, please do turn on your video. Because we wanted to make this hour and a half session um, mimic as much as possible what it might be like to be in person, all the distractions and interjections included, we elected to make this a webinar Zoom format rather than a meeting. So that means that you all can engage. That being said, as I already said, do mute yourself unless you're posing a question or speaking. Feel free to use the chat box as much as you want. And we absolutely love seeing Zoom emojis flying by our screen. So engage in whatever way uh, works for you. For the best experience for this evening, um, while our speakers are talking, you might wanna be in speaker view. So if you go to the top of your top right of the Zoom black screen where you're maybe seeing faces now, it should say view. If you click on that, you can select speaker view or gallery view. So we're suggesting you click on speaker view um, for most of the session until we get to the question and answer. That way you'll just see the speaker on the screen and a bunch of other beautiful faces at the top of your screen. Great. All right, now that we have some of that housekeeping sorted, uh, I would like to kick this evening off by paying respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of the land where the offices of Results Canada are in Ottawa. We at Results acknowledge their longstanding relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. The Algonquin people have lived on this land since time immemorial, and we are very grateful to have the opportunity to be present in this territory today. We are gathered here today because World Tuberculosis Day is tomorrow. Did you know that before the start of the pandemic, TB was the leading infectious disease killer in the world? In 2019, about 10 million people fell sick with the respiratory disease and an estimated 1.4 million died. We know that because of COVID-19 lockdowns and disruptions, many more people will die of tuberculosis. It is absolutely heartbreaking to witness that heart health systems around the world including here in Canada, we're not equipped to respond to an emergency and maintain essential health services like TB services. The reason for this has largely been that governments have long neglected investing adequately to put the health of their people first. That's why we're here today, tonight, to learn more and to take action in support of making sure that everybody is invested in and that the health of people is put first in the agenda setting of Canada. TB has existed for over a century and it is still present in every country in the world. So to commence this evening's web webinar, I am absolutely delighted to introduce you to Priya Amin, who will be delivering our opening remarks by sharing her story of conquering TB. Priya, over to you. Thank you, Robin, and good evening, everybody. So a year ago when COVID first hit, I felt a strange and familiar attachment resurface to my days and months as a TB patient. Just like COVID, anyone, be it you, the person beside you, a loved one, anyone can contract TB. I was born and raised in Toronto to parents who immigrated to North America from India and Zimbabwe in the late 60s. I'm an educator by trade and as such, I received a TB skin test over the course of 15 years to satisfy employment requirements in schools. In the summer of 2015, I should have been at my new workplace. Instead, I received a phone call telling me that the TB test I took came back positive 
for active pulmonary and presumed extrapulmonary TB. Having active TB means that you're infectious. You need treatment to treat the disease. I was put into quarantine mode immediately and a case manager from Toronto Public Health arrived at my place within the hour to walk me through the process. I called my parents and they made their way, their way over to my place. I'll never forget the look of sadness, worry and fear on their faces as they watched my case manager and I discuss the particulars of this disease, standard protocols, available services and the restrictions that would now be placed upon my life. You never want your parents to see you in any kind of pain. So I kept my fear at bay, discovered an awesome poker face and laughed more than I wanted to. My inner goofy child took over and I kept it light and was detached from the reality of what just rocked my world until everyone left. I thought to myself, I have to wear a mask if someone visits me. Visitors were not encouraged. When leaving my condo on the 21st floor, I would have to wear a mask. And lastly, and most terrifying, could I die? I even prepared a six month bucket list. There would be no going to work, the grocery store, restaurants, seeing and kissing my loved ones or having the occasional glass of wine and daily routines would be suspended until I was able to produce a negative smear test. I didn't know anyone with tuberculosis, nor have I traveled to an endemic country since my last negative test two years prior. Ignorantly, I really didn't know much about tuberculosis. In my mind, it was a disease of the past in Canada. Six months prior to my diagnosis, I noticed a small lump on the side of my neck. My family doctor concluded that the lump was the result of some environmental pollutant and that I was low in iron. Pop some, pill, pop some iron pills for three months, Priya, and you'll be fine. I went in for a second opinion and the same results returned. Fast forward six months and for the first time in 15 years after taking the TB skin test, I had what looked like an enlarged mosquito bite on my arm. I would learn that this was a positive skin test, but with a normal chest X-ray, the infectious disease doctor believed I had latent TB. A quarter of the world's population, about 2 billion people, have latent TB. If you have latent TB, the bacteria remains in your body in an inactive state and you have no symptoms and you're not infectious. However, treatment is recommended to help reduce the spread of TB. I had some symptoms associated with active tuberculosis. I had a persistent dry cough, fatigue, loss of appetite, swollen lymph node, and weight loss. The hardest part in sharing my illness with loved ones was seeing and experiencing their fear and isolation. From one perspective, I viewed it as a slightly selfish act as some distanced themselves from me. But from another perspective, I wondered if I was in their shoes, what would I do? My sickness was not a well-known one here in Canada and Google became my best and my worst friend. My relationship with the internet took on a life of its own from day one. Researching the possible side effects of the meds started to create doubt. Soon into treatment, I learned that my strain of TB was resistant to one of the drugs, so it was switched out for another one. I was handling these drugs like a champ with no real side effects until six weeks later. When I finally started my first day of work, I thought I was back to life living it like a regular person would. Five days into the job, I received a call telling me that I needed to stop taking my medicine immediately and return to quarantine, which was estimated to be two weeks as my liver function tests were rising and it was not safe for me to continue taking medicine. Unfortunately, it was not two weeks of quarantine, but three months rather. With concerning levels of my liver function tests, I was referred for a liver biopsy. Those meds definitely wreaked havoc on my insides and I was admitted to a, to a hospital for a couple of nights. Good news arrived though for the week of Christmas. I started a new drug regimen the first week in January of 2016 and I returned to work a few weeks later and completed full treatment nine months later in October of 2016. 
Popping these pills before work almost always led to vomiting, nausea, and fatigue. There were many days when I didn't want to take my medicine, but reminded myself of how fortunate I was to be living in Canada, a country with access to healthcare and treatment. I was officially discharged as a patient in October of 2017. Having active TB in Canada means that I'm assigned to the DOT program, which is directly observed therapy, a program for, with, for which without, I don't know where I would be. It's a free program. It helps and ensures that you take your medicine and cure TB and provide support and information to you as well. The relationships that I formed with my nurse and my case manager had me feeling supported and that I wasn't alone in this highly stigmatized, isolating and lonely illness. And reminded me that while my case seemed bad to me, it really wasn't, it was just unusually complicated. I would learn about the dire experiences and diagnosis of others in our city, to the North, our country at large and around the globe and could not imagine what their plight would be like for me. I'll never forget the time I was waiting to pick up my meds from the pharmacy at the clinic when a young lady approached me and said, do you have TB too? Is this your first time picking up your medication? In that moment, I was compelled to keep her spirits as high as possible. As I remember being her, my first time and how daunting it all was. And as such, I replied, no, it's not my first time. I've been on meds for about six months and it's going to be okay. You might feel a little tired or nauseous when you take these meds, but you will keep going. She shared that she was 21, had just moved here from Africa, had a one-year-old at home and would have to take medicine for nine months. She had latent TB. Her distress and fear were so evident and she wondered if she could handle it all. I reminded her that TB is curable as long as you take your treatment and stay on your meds. As a TB patient, the ability to connect with TB patients past or present is vital to the journey that one goes through. Reading case stories online, mainly from those living in other countries is eye-opening and provides some solace. However, the need for live contact, be it in person or over the phone, computer, in my opinion, has the capacity to ease the hardships of TB. The physical effects are one thing, the emotional and mental toll are another. Throughout my chapter of, throughout this chapter of my life, denial, despair, fear, gratitude, strength, and unwavering support from a cherished few helped me rise above and conquer TB. To this day, I still get choked up as I recount my story and carry with me a mental burden that it could resurface. When I have a dry cough, I'm unusually fatigued and I'm losing weight inexplicably, my mind is met with some paranoia that it's returned. I've been tested three times since being discharged, the last being August of 2020. I'm glad that all of my tests have been negative. In closing, as a member of the Stop TB Canada Steering Committee, I'm motivated more than ever to become more intimately involved with the national and global fight to end TB, while also focusing on the dire need of improved patient care. What is needed to achieve these goals is a coordinated action by many partners, including all levels of government on several fronts. Some of these fronts include awareness and education, which include the more culturally aware and sensitive approach in delivering and sharing information with those who must undergo treatment and or monitoring. Medical advancements, community-led TB initiatives, a global-led TB elimination effort, a national registry of Canadians with lived experience to serve as a support resource, an accurate and timely data on TB incidents and mortality rates across the different communities. Thank you very much for allowing me to share my story here tonight. Priya, thank you so very much for sharing your story. We are so grateful. 
um, that you're here to share it with us and also that you've turned that experience into being a huge massively high impact champion uh, and now I understand on the advisory board of Stop TV Canada so thank you for that. Uh, we're going to turn um, the tide a little bit now we're going to dig into our panel conversation our panel discussion and I'm first going to introduce um, uh, our, our two discussants uh, have a bit of a conversation and then turn it over to you for some questions um, to, to the folks on the call. But uh, first, it's my great, I'm Chris Dendies. I'm the Executive Director of Results Canada. I always forget to introduce myself, but uh, uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to um, first Dr. Joya Mukherjee. Uh, Dr. Mukherjee is uh, the Chief Medical Officer of Partners in Health uh, PIH. Uh, globally and an international, it's an international medical charity dedicated to providing a prefer preferential option um, for the poor in healthcare. She's an internist, a pediatrician, an infectious disease doctor, a public health specialist, associate professor uh, of medicine at Harvard. Uh, and she's also, you know, supported PIH's efforts to provide high quality comprehensive health care to the poorest in partnership with local communities around the world. So she's also a global health hero and a rock star. So I just wanted to, to welcome to welcome Joya. I'd also really like to introduce, and it's just a deep honor to introduce uh, Tina Campbell. Tina is um, uh, uh, an Indigenous woman of Cree ancestry from Treaty 5 territory. Her commitment to TB uh, work started when she was a nursing student, uh, given a summer placement in a TB clinic in Nunavut in 2010, with rates of TB being, as, as I think uh, somebody said earlier, 290 times greater uh, in Northern Canada than Southern Canada. Her learning and experience grew quite quickly. She became a registered nurse in 2013, and she continues to work, continued to work as a TB nurse for, for five years, where her main roles were case management, contact tracing, surveillance, uh, she's been a TB educator uh, and also uh, since September of 2019, she's been in the TB advisory role for the Northern Inter-Tribal Health Authority um, based up in Northern Saskatchewan. So Tina and Joya, welcome to this conversation on the eve of World TB Day, a day that deserves, uh, you know, all of the attention that it should merit given the um, disease burden associated with TB and the impacts far beyond even uh, the individuals that it afflicts. To get going, maybe we th we thought we'd just start with a bit of an icebreaker question, and before we kind of dig into some of the TB specific questions, I would really love to hear from you if you're willing, if you'd love to share, if you could share a story with us about a time that you felt particularly inspired uh, and motivated by the work that you do. Maybe I'll start with uh, with Joya. Joya, are you on mute? Sorry. Can I, I can't hear you, I'm afraid. I'm not sure. I think you're on mute, Joya. You're I on was mute. on mute. Is it better? It yeah, was like it's beeping. perfect. Okay. It's perfect. We were reading your lips, but it's better yeah. if we can hear so you. So I, I love to sing and I am often singing with our team around the world in the 12 countries that PIH uh, serves and with patients. And you know, some of the sickest patients that we take care of in the world are our patients with drug resistant TB. And, you know, often they are from very difficult backgrounds, very poor, extremely food insecure, and, you know, just really emaciated because it's taken so long for them to get the proper diagnosis. And I had been, it was actually my very last trip before the COVID lockdown. And I had been in Liberia about six months before. And that's a place where we actually um, run the, the TB sanatorium with the government um, of Liberia. And there was a young woman who had been brought in um, about a year before I met her. And she was just still quite emaciated after six months and lying in her bed. And she was really very young. Um, and so when I went on rounds, as I often do, um, they, I said, I really need to see Maron is her name. And she came jauntily walking out and um, we sang together. 
And here's a picture of me and my colleague, Dr. Max Oluma, a Canadian, uh, who is from Haiti via Vancouver and now is our executive director in Liberia. And Maron and I uh, sang a song uh, together and everybody joined us. And it was before COVID really hit, it was February of uh, 2019. Uh, so that's my last was my sort of send off for the next year of being grounded. And she's now been discharged and we've also helped her start a, a small business and she keeps in touch with our staff. I love that story. Thank you so, so much for sharing. I can just imagine you singing as you're going through the quarters. Um, Tina, over to you. Do you have a do you have a story or a time that you um, felt particularly inspired that you like to share with us? Um, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Tina. I would like to acknowledge that I am talking to you today from Treaty 6, the traditional territory of the Cree and the homeland of the Métis people. Um, I believe that every day can be inspiring and motivating. That is the good thing about being in healthcare. No two days worked are the same. There are times working frontline as a registered nurse in TB that can be very challenging especially if you are case managing clients or patients who are receiving directly observed therapy or DOT. As you know, treatment for TB can be anywhere from six to 12 months or more, depending on the location of the disease and whether it is active TB disease or latent TB infection. This can require a lot of resources, time and a collaborative effort from many players. I have been grateful throughout my career to have had amazing colleagues who share the same passion for TB elimination as I do. Therefore, every time a client comp completed treatment, I felt motivated. I would often bake a cake or get a little treat for if they were children. I always love celebrating that accomplishment. It is extremely important to remember how much a TB diagnosis can change your life and lifestyle while you're on treatment and sometimes lifelong. Some people may experience obstacles, for example. They may experience stigma. They may experience loss of relationships due to other people's perceptions of TB or loss of income due to taking time off work. TB not only impacts one physically, but socially, emotionally, mentally, economically as well. People overcome so much throughout the course of a treatment and to push through and make it to treatment completion, there's just no better feeling than being a part of that. I am also especially motivated when I have the opportunity to educate others about TB. Thank you so much for that, Tina. You're right, every, it's the small celebrations which are actually so big, aren't they, in terms of particularly the TB sort of journey. Uh, to turn, the, to turn the next question to TB specifically, and I, and I think we're gonna talk a little bit about the implications of COVID, which is impossible to ignore um, after this, but just maybe before we get to, to that reality, uh, you've both been engaged in the fight to NTB for, for a number of years and very committed to it as I've articulated in your bios, but also just as I know personally. Can you explain to the to the people on the call, maybe share what your experience or, or what the experience for communities affected by TB was like even before the pandemic? Um, and maybe just some thoughts on despite it being preventable and cur uh, curable, why is TB the leading infectious killer in the world still? Tina or Priya, either one can just hop in. Or Joya, I mean. Joya, did you want to share a response? I am happy to, but I would defer if Tina would like to say something. Absolutely. Tina? So professionally, I work for an Indigenous organization that serves residents living on First Nations Reserve. Prior to the pandemic, there was a lot of stigma surrounding TB in general. The intergenerational trauma passed down from TB sanatoria and Indigenous experiences have developed and continued a mistrust for any sort of institution, especially healthcare. There are negative feelings like shame attached to TB, fear of implications a TB diagnosis may have on one's life, lifestyle, profession, or family and friend dynamics may deter someone to seek medical attention. 
Fear of TB is the driving force behind stigma. That stigma was not only among community members, but also among health staff as well. Often TB is a program that is overshadowed by other health programming in communities as some clinics are chronically understaffed. Our communities are lucky enough to have TB program workers who are trained to administer directly observed therapy, arrange TB clinics and x-ray clinics, and uh, with our nurse clinicians and physicians from our TB prevention and control. And essentially, well, these TB program workers workers run the TB programs in the communities. Our organization has dedicated TB nurses who will assist and provide guidance and assistance in communities, often when a case is identified and contact tracing and investigation is required to be done. I believe it continues to be the leading infectious disease killer in the world because despite promises from higher level agencies, um, we must first change our attitudes towards TB. Our staff provides training endlessly to community health nurses who are unfortunately not in the communities very long. There's such a high turn turnover of staff and a decreased interest of taking on the TB program. Determinants of health among First Nations communities continue to impact the incidence of TB. People are living in crowded living conditions with poor ventilation systems. Lack of adequate housing has been an ongoing issue amongst the Indigenous communities. Inadequate nutrition, especially in our remote flying communities where food prices are astronomical. Yeah. It can be very stressful for a community when there is a TB case identified. Our job continues to, to be to support and build capacity within the community in the hopes that people will become less and less scared of TB. One example is training local members as TB program workers. This allows community members to be a part of the health and wellness of their own communities. This gives them the power. Um, <clears throat> prior to the pandemic and continues, um, so TB treatment, there's a minimum of four antibiotics if you're being treated for active TB. So that's quite a bit of pills. Um, sometimes people are just thrown off by that to begin with. And as you might know, a number of, of active cases um, come from untreated latent TB infection. Um, so those with diagnosed latent TB, um, it's really hard to convince them to take treatment for that because they feel well and they, they, they just don't want to take medication. Yeah. I, I think some of the saddest sort of you know, reflections I've had, you know, working in this space is oftentimes with directly observed treatment over the months, somebody with TB might start feeling better. And then as they're feeling better, their appetite is returning and they're hungry. And then without, in a resource poor setting when they don't have access to food, then it's another reason why they then stop taking the meds. I mean, it's just, mm -hmm. it's kind of heartbreaking when you think about that cycle of scarcity and poverty. And I, and I just as a, I, uh, Joy, I know that you have worked in Navajo Nation in, in mm -hmm. the US, but also just in, in communities around the world. I guess same same re question or reflection from you in terms of the even the pre-COVID era, what yeah. it was like to, for, for in uh, those communities. Well, I mean, <clears throat> I really wanted to hear from Tina first and defer to a nurse, first of all. The nurses are our front lines around the world against tuberculosis, but so too are indigenous communities. Uh, so too are the most impoverished. And um, the people who are, and I say impoverished, not poor, because it is the active extraction of resources from black and brown and indigenous people around the world that creates the conditions for TB. And Priya was, a uh, unfortunate person and is now using her power to speak out. But TB is largely a disease of people for whom their resources have been extracted, their land has been stolen, they're working in mines, uh, in, uh, in slavery conditions. And so we have to think about a kind of uh, reparatory framework if we're going to take care of TB, as Tina said, 
the social forces, lack of housing, overcrowding, poor nutrition are the things that set up the environment for TV. Not in all cases, but in the large majority of cases. And those have been created by policy choices, created by policy choices. And so I think what's so important about the work that Results is doing as an organization that does grassroots advocacy is demand a change in those policy choices. We saw tuberculosis decline linearly in the 1940s in New York City before there was even an active drug because of at the end of the Second World War, people were able financially to move out of tenements. My colleague, I see uh, Madhu Pai from McGill is on the phone and he has written a lot on the whole notion of decolonizing uh, the way we think about health and putting people like Tina and her, her colleagues in the front seat and really allowing them to lead us. You know, I, as a physician, I, it, to me, it's like the parable of stone soup, right? I have carrots, but I don't have the soup. Who has the, the, the all the other ingredients are the nurses, the local traditional leaders, the school teachers. And I think we've got to think about TB as an indictment of our system of racism and colonialism um, and oppression. And I have rarely, if ever, seen other than health workers, occasionally teachers, um, prison guards, the, the majority of my patients who've had TB, and that number's now in the thousands in my career, um, have been people who have been historically and are currently being oppressed. So you cannot separate TB from the political choices that we make that continue oppression. I can agree more. TB is an indictment, an indictment of our system and also just a proxy for ingrained uh, inequity. Um, Tina, just listening to listening to Joya respond and listening to your response, I am also thinking of COVID. Everybody is experienced, COVID is experience, being experienced very differently um, from your vantage point in terms of uh, uh, your status, whatever, uh, in terms of your poverty, whatnot, but the, the entire world has been impacted by the pandemic and some people have been, been more affected than others, I guess is what I'm trying to say. So from your vantage point, how has the COVID pandemic affected uh, people living with TB particularly hard? Tina? Um, the pandemic has been obviously difficult for all of us, um, but our TB programming is one of the very few programs that have continued to operate as clients and patients need their treatment. COVID-19 has overshadowed pretty much everything. Health centers are operating for emergencies only to decrease any chance of transmission of COVID-19. Individuals are not seen as quickly as we would have seen and causing delays in diagnosis. Also, some symptoms of, of extra pulmonary TB can mimic other illnesses or diseases, and TB is not even on the care provider's radar upon assessment. COVID-19 and pulmonary TB have similar symptoms as well, cough, fever, fatigue, and perhaps people are continually screened for COVID but not TB. As I had mentioned, First Nations communities continue to face inequities, housing especially. And often there can be upwards to 10 people in a household at one time, which can increase the risk and spread of illnesses. What we have seen in our numbers is no increase in cases in comparison from last year. However, the cases diagnosed are at an advanced stage of disease. For example, smear positive plus four or disseminated TB. In these cases, they may require hospitalization and if clients or patients are unable to safely isolate in their home due to overcrowded crowding, they are sent hundreds of kilometers away from home. Normally, isolation in a hospital is already difficult and can be especially traumatic for Indigenous clients or patients due to the negative historical events that surround the TB care of Indigenous population. Clients and patients are kept in negative pressure rooms on their own and now put COVID restrictions on top of that where there are no visitors permitted, it can get very lonely. Uh, 
Joya, do you have any reflections on on the impact as well of of uh, COVID on TB in terms of dialing back progress or yeah. any, any reflections from that vantage? Yeah, I I would say you know around the world there isn't um, as much strength as Tina is referring to because I believe that a lot of patients have been um, unable to follow up with treatments um, even. Uh, and, and Priya mentioned the DOT program, the directly observed therapy. In many countries, that is clinic-based. So there's nobody who's going to come to your house or to meet you. We at Partners in Health, we do try to have our DOT be a visit from somebody at your house, which I think is so critical, particularly now. Um, but then uh, many of the community health workers that would do that job were not protected. So we had to work with others to make sure that they had the community mm -hmm. health workers, the right uh, personal protective equipment and weren't just sitting ducks on the front line of COVID. So it definitely took us some time, but around the world, this clinic based DOT is really uh, problematic for the poorest people for whom the opportunity cost of getting to clinic, even in normal times, is quite high. And certainly right now during lockdown is almost impossible. So I do think there will be a lot of people who are not able to be maintained on therapy and we may see more drug resistance. So we're certainly on the lookout for that. The the second thing I would say um, is that health systems are just too weak. And, you know, we have many tuberculosis patients around the world who are literally suffocating. They, they have so much respiratory damage. They, they literally cannot breathe. And so I, you know, one of the things we've seen now with COVID is the need for oxygen which we always had, but COVID has unmasked this. And in, for example, in the entire nation of Peru, which is a middle income country, there's no oxygen. There's no oxygen. The, the waiting list for oxygen in Peru is 7,000 people. So those 7,000 people are literally suffocating. So we've got to do a much better job. Again, at, if we think of tuberculosis as the bellwether for how we treat one another, for um, how we provide care. Had we developed good systems of community-based work, of case finding, but also of hospital treatment, we would have done better. And then the last thing I, I want to add, uh, you know, the work of my colleague and friend Salman Kashavji, who's working on what, what uh, they call the Zero TB Initiative, is really about preventive therapy. Um, many of us, myself included, grew up having what we used to be called the TB Tine test. It was a skin test that we'd have regularly every year so that if you had latent TB, as, as Priya talked about, you would be treated with the treat, you know, the prophylactic or the preventive treatment for getting uh, active infection. Around the world, that's been basically withheld from people. It's too complicated. And so for every household, you know, for every new case, two, three, five household contacts are then infected. And that is a very simple thing to do. And that was another way that in the United States, we drove down the rates of tuberculosis. But so we're fighting for really comprehensive treatment from case finding to treatment to prevention among contacts and right into having oxygen if you need it. And so, I, you know, what I see is that COVID has strained this entire system. Um, and part of it is, you know, think of in the U.S. anyway, our health system was strained by it. And we spend $10,000 per patient per year on health care. So imagine in other places that we don't spend our dollars well, that's a story for another time. Um, but, uh, but, I, but I think what we've seen is fragmentation at every level is becoming worse because of COVID.
I'm going to go to the audience in a second so you can you can sort of be thinking and preparing your preparing some questions because I hope we can get to a few before before our hours up but but I do you know results is a is an organization that focuses on hope and solutions <laughs> or tries to in terms of our advocacy and I just as we're talking about TB and COVID-19 both being airborne infectious diseases and similarity related to many aspects of them uh, rather than just even thinking we know that there's a lot of setbacks uh, and that progress is being turned back. But are there, do you see any hope or opportunity? Are there ways that investments toward COVID-19 efforts could be leveraged to improve the TB response? Or uh, is there a simultaneous response to COVID-19 and TB happening on the ground? And, and if not, why? And, and what could we be doing to sort of make that, make that happen? Uh, Tina, maybe over to you first and then Joya, and then we'll go to the audience. Okay, so um, our response to TB has never stopped within our organization. Um, but in our communities, our TB program workers' duties are limited just to DOT and medication administration. Um, usually, um, in, a, in normal times, if anybody can remember what those were like, yeah. um, <laughs> our TB program workers would also, you know, facilitate and put on um, TB education days, TB awareness days, and we would help help them with that and um, offer resources that they can use. So obviously none of that has been done since last March um, due to the COVID-19 restrictions. Um, and as we said before too, you know, a TB diagnosis can have, can be, um, have several implications and impacts on one's life. Um, so I think on, with those, there's social, emotional, mental, and economic impacts, which is what I stated in one of my first comments. Um, in terms of like the care of COVID and TB together, I don't see that happening mm -hmm. um, in our region at all. Um, it's just mostly focused on COVID. Um, there are there are TB clients who you know face addic addiction issues for example, alcohol use. And with COVID-19, the, there are managed alcohol programs that became available for, for clients who, who are COVID-19 positive. Um, there were also trailers brought into communities to assist uh, with isolation when it was not attainable in a household due to, overcrowd due to overcrowding. Where was all the support for the TB program? We reach, we want to reach, if we want to reach our goal to eradicate TB by 2030, more efforts need to be turned towards TB elimination, um, resource information development. <clears throat> also ensuring that these resources are available in all languages that populations are serving. Also <clears throat> a collaboration to eliminate stigma throughout the healthcare field. Ensuring TB programs are mandatory for all staff in communities where TB rates are high. Um, and if you're serving Indigenous communities, ensuring cultural awareness training for people to become aware of the historical events in regards to TB and Indigenous people. Um, I think those are all very important things and to move forward. Um, I hope we can come back from the kind of setback that we've, we've endured from this COVID-19 pandemic. I think that was very, very well put. And, you know, it is amazing to me that, you know, when you think like an organization that results that deals with that, it works in advocacy, the amazing political will that has been generated in terms of the COVID response, if only we could, we could take some of that and generate it towards the TB response, which I guess is what we're, what we're trying to do. But Joya, any reflections on some of the spaces for, for the open spaces for hope in terms of uh, applying some of the lessons to the DP struggle, or at least um, mm -hmm. some positive outcomes? I mean, I think I think so. I'm I'm an undying optimist, but a couple of things uh, that I think are opening up for us. Partners in Health has been asked to help in the United States beyond Navajo, but uh, in and we focus mostly on communities, uh, you know, that uh, are supported by, uh, are populated by people of color, run by people of color, places like Newark, New Jersey, Immokalee, Florida, um, and of course, Navajo. 
of Montgomery, Alabama. And what we've seen is that the deep ties that people have within community can be leveraged even in the United States. The United States can be a very individualistic society, but we've been able to really work together with communities to have more mutual aid and support and have community health workers doing things like contact tracing for COVID, uh, which is right out of the tuberculosis playbook. Um, and so I think we're seeing the strength of community. Um, and then and secondly, I would say that we um, we have seen people leverage these platforms uh, together. So, for example, our team in Peru has been doing dual case finding um, in the home for both TB and COVID, which has been um, a very important. Um, and we've seen the laboratory infrastructure that some countries have built for, for example, for Ebola now being leveraged for COVID and, and the delays being less than they would have been five years ago in a place like Liberia. Um, and so I think we're seeing the synergies of building health systems and working with community. But uh, I would say the big elephant in the room globally is the vaccine apartheid that we're facing. And so that we have to learn and take a book from the, um, eight, the AIDS treatment access movement and really just not take no for an answer. We've got to get you know um, the patents, uh, share the know-how and make sure that we can massively scale up production of the mRNA vaccines and not have like a secondary kind of vaccine going to particularly Southern Africa where we know the AstraZeneca vaccine is not as effective against the South African variant. So I think there's a lot of positive lessons in health system strengthening in community um, working with community, uh, but I, I, you know, still worry about this creation of first, second, third world, which is not really the world as it should be. Thank you. Thank you both for, thank you both for that conversation and for answering those questions so well and so eloquently. Um, I'm just going to bring Priya back into the conversation, Priya, and just would love to throw it open to anybody that might have some um, uh, questions. Please feel free to put them in the chat for our guests. We've got about 10 minutes to, uh, to uh, answer some questions or ask some questions. So I do have a question for Tina actually. How can we strengthen activism for TB in Indigenous communities? That is a terrific question. Uh, Tina? That's from Trevor. You're on, yeah. So ways we can strengthen activism in communities. Um, to have people more engaged, uh, I think you need to provide a lot of um, education and awareness. And that just starts too as well with, with um, ensuring that you have resources in the language that you need, need as well. Um, some people might still be unilingual, um, which, you know, we want to be sure that we're in, including everybody in, in our teachings and our education. Um, because once you educate people and people become aware and knowledgeable with about TB, um, it'll become less scary mm -hmm. for them. And then community members, you know, might be more willing to, to join, um, you know, in the fight. And there might be people that have experienced TB or gone through TB treatment um, to come forward and share their stories. Um, so it all, you know, comes down to education and awareness and, and um, us who work frontline and have, you know, quite a bit of experience in TB um, don't mind sharing that knowledge with people either. Thank you. I just, I know that uh, I just wanted to acknowledge Willie, um, who is in, who has been posting in the chat based in um, DRC. Yeah. Uh, and a TB survivor. Um, uh, I know it's late there. I think it's almost midnight. <laughs> but uh, he has he's indicated that you know living with one lung is difficult. It's one of the one of the impacts of TB. And I think that's mm -hmm. um, just so disheartening. So Willie, know that we are um, we are thinking of you. And I guess his his question was really about um, you know the kinds of organizations on the ground or or that that can be helping. Um, 
TB patients, TB, you know, in, in, in local communities. And maybe it's a, also a question just generally about, you know, Joy, maybe you could share a little bit too about this, about just the frontline community health workers and the necessity of, you know, paid quality partnered with uh, local communities and frontline community health workers are on the vanguard of all of this. I know that even before COVID, there were, I don't know, millions and millions short in terms of those frontline mm -hmm. um, health care providers. Do you have any reflections on that? Yeah, um, thanks. You know, the way we uh, consider the right to health at Partners in Health and, you know, in our reading of, of human rights, there's really two parts, right? One is the, that the government re respects, protects, and fulfills rights. We all ask our governments to do that. I think that's what makes it particularly challenging for indigenous people, for example, where the government they're working under has broken every treaty, certainly in the case of the US and I believe Canada as well. But then the second piece of human rights is for civil society to demand their rights and to be organized. And I think one of the things, again, you're doing well at results is saying, let's organize ourselves to demand certain things of our government. Um, and so when I reflect on, um, on that work, this is one of the reasons that community health workers are so important because if they're linked to a health system, they can be on the front lines of that demand, but they also are close and proximate. So for me, I often say to our teams, I'm less interested in the community health workers being community health workers, but I wa rather want them to be community health workers. I want them to tell me what the struggles are, teach me what's happening in the community. As Tina says, that cultural understanding, you know, which families are in distress, where is help needed? And that's how you really make that human rights dialectic work is by having active engagement through the community. So the shortage of health workers in general around the world is the same impoverishment, and we have to keep fighting back on that. Things like the Global Fund, which results fought for and continues to fight for, have paid you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of health workers around the world where, where there was no money at all. So that has helped. But we still have to think of how do we support governments and how do we simultaneously support civil society? Thank you for that, Joya. Um, I have a question for Pri, actually. Uh, First of all, it's from, from Petra, a friend. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing your story and for your dream of building a network of TB survivors in Canada. Can you talk a little bit more about what this what this dream is and, and how we can help you? I love that. It might be the last question we get to uh, during this session, but, uh, but please, Priya, do you have any, can you share anything on that? You're on mute, hon. There we go. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Petra, uh, for that question. Um, since being diagnosed, I have had this vision uh, here to develop a support group um, where, you know, with TB and, and privacy issues, it's, it's, it's a challenge to be able to even identify those who um, are going through treatment or who have gone through treatment unless um, their will is to disclose that information. And so... Um, through initial and recent discussions um, uh, with uh, Robin um, and Stop TV and Results Canada, um, creating um, even like a listserv, um, uh, an ongoing listserv would be a um, great thing to have where questions can just be, you know, generated out in an email listserv and, and e-blasted to everybody within this network of um, people with lived experience and also with uh, perhaps uh, Facebook or social media creating uh, a group for Canadians um, affected and impacted by tuberculosis. And that also could be branched out to including their loved ones as well. And I, I don't feel that the burden of educating your loved ones about tuberculosis should fall solely on the patient. And so that too is included in this vision that I have um, in being able to have loved ones um, also be a part of the ongoing dialogue. And, you know, right now, to be um, very honest, um, with this dream and, and 
you know, kind of grassroots starting the, the infancy steps of what I believe will become a standard um, uh, registry of sorts um, is that the clinics that are, are treating patients, they're, they're, right now I don't know enough to know how we can get around that loophole of sharing information from clinics. If you're going to a clinic to be treated for TB, could it be um, a conversation piece where you're asked, are you, do you want to share your information to this lift server registry? And that's how we're getting people that are being treated um, for TB um, in the present to be able to feel supported and share their story. I think you know, it's in Canada. I think there's so many stories that need to be shared. And as we've heard also from Tina and, and Joya, uh, our indigenous population, um, those stories need to be told and not kept um, kind of underneath the rug. And I think that um, Trudeau, you know, when he delivered a, an apology of sorts um, in 2019, um, you know, perhaps was the first micro step of what can be a larger macro um, step forward in, in really acknowledging it and not seeing it as an other people's disease. I think it's a beautiful vision and I'm glad that you're part of this Top TB Canada Advisory Board and I'm also glad to be working with you and for you sharing your story. And Joya and Tina, thank you so much for being a part of this conversation. You are all inspiring and we're grateful. So, um, so thank you very much for all of your work. Um, and I'm going to hand it over to Robin now, who's going to lead us into the next part of the con of the of this this evening. But thank you all, and everybody. World TB Day tomorrow, so let's just continue to shout from the raft from the from the rooftops, in terms of putting a drawing more attention to this important issue. Thanks. Thank you so like much, it. Chris. Thank you, everybody. Give her a round of applause mm -hmm. emoji if you can. Thank you. Good luck with your board meeting this evening, Chris. We appreciate your, your, you being here and to all of our panelists, um, thank you so much. So now that we've learned a thing or two more uh, about tuberculosis, uh, let's, let's do something about it together. So we, we at Results Canada were, were well versed in equipping and, immo and mobilizing advocates to take action. And we know the power of people. And as Joya said, we know that part of realizing human rights is that citizens demand that their human rights are upheld. So um, we can't just learn about these, these, these causes that we care about and, and not take that civic action. So we're gonna take civic action together right now um, there's many ways you can take action. Tonight, because time is limited, we're, we're gonna be taking a social media action. So if you have Twitter, please open your, your Twitter account right now. Um, it might seem like a small action and you don't think it matters, but trust me, if we're taking um, political influencers and decision makers in our tweet, they are collecting data on what is being talked about in the social media world, and they're taking notes. So it, it does have a, a ripple effect. Um, we also do things like have meetings with members of parliament so that we're raising the awareness and educating them about issues that we care about. We write letters to ministers when, it's, when, it's, when it makes good sense to do so. We raise general public awareness like this. We speak to relevant committees on the Hill. We engage with contacts at public institutions like Global Affairs Canada or the Public Health Agency of Canada. All of these different types of, of action are really important for moving the needle towards the issues we care about. So you met Tina and Priya, and you've met me now as well. We all sit on the steering committee of Stop TV Canada. And Stop TV Canada is really all about mobilizing um, Canadians who care about TV and, and working together to end it at home and abroad. So we are going to take two actions, one with a domestic focus here in Canada, um, wanting to get Minister Petty Hadju, who is the Minister of Health, to make sure that we have up-to-date epidemiological data on TV. Why? Because we don't. The last time Canadians saw TV data in our country is data from 2017. Yet we 
our government has said over and over again that we need to have up-to-date annual data to be able to respond appropriately to TB. So we want to make that change immediately. We've got a, a, a tweet that um, I'd like everybody to send out. I'm going to have my colleague copy and paste it in the um, chat box so that you can just send it out through your Twitter. And I'm going to do it with you so I know how long it will take you to do it yourself. So I'm copying this copy right now and going into my Twitter. Please do this with me. And I'm going to hit paste. And essentially, I'm calling on, on Patty to make sure that we have um, up-to-date TB data here in Canada so that we can respond accordingly. Um, pretty shocking that we don't, particularly given that we've got real-time live data um, about COVID. If we can do it for COVID, we can do it for TB. Okay, so we're gonna hit send. And my colleague's also gonna share a letter to the Minister of Health that the Stop TB Canada Network sent the other week. So if you wanna learn more, you can uh, take the time to read that. All right. Next, for the action that we're going to take, it's our, it's our global action. So Stop TB Canada, we always have a domestic ask and a global ask. So I am going to share with you a special closing remark address from Luchika, who is the executive director of the Global Stop TB Partnership, who's going to tell you a little bit about TB Reach. So TB Reach was founded with Canadian uh, resources. It's an innovative financing mechanism that gets money out the door quickly to communities who are on the ground and can respond to um, TB. It's particularly important that Canada maintains investment in TB reach during a pandemic when we know that there's massive gaps in service provision. So, Luchika's address, let me just get it up. It's hidden. And then after we hear from her, we'll do this action together, okay? Um, hello, everybody. It's a, a great honor to be here with you uh, today. And uh, I really want uh, to thank you all for uh, putting in motion so much efforts for the world today, starting most and foremost with uh, our friends from Stop TV Partnership Canada for the events on World TV Day but also our very close partners from Results Canada, Partners in Health Canada, and so on. It's World TB Day, 2021. Uh, for some of us working in TB for, such a, for a long time, such as myself, uh, you know, if uh, somebody would have tell us uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, um, that we will still be in 2021 at the stage where TB kills 4,000 people a day, and TB is the biggest infectious disease killer, even now in the presence of COVID in the high burden TB countries, probably most of us would have disagree with it or those of us that were at least 10 years ago in this business. I don't think um, so many of us were in two years ago in exactly the same business. So, uh, because uh, a lot of our work uh, was aimed to uh, end TB and uh, by 2030, and uh, you know, the closer we get to that year, the closer you expect that the numbers will diminish and there will be some great uh, impact that we can share. And unfortunately due to COVID, uh, our hopes of reaching uh, the 2030 end of TB, but may also or mostly the UN high level meeting targets by end of 2022 are pretty uh, diminished. Um, you see, uh, we have a very short time frame to really uh, continue our efforts and really uh, be able to achieve uh, our targets in such a way that we can hope that by the end of 2030 we will end TB. And I think we have what it takes in terms of energy and ambition to do this. And uh, I think we have what it takes in terms of innovations and desire to bring new innovative ways of delivering care and uh, tools to people that are in most need. And from Stop TB, we, were, we are very proud to be always at the forefront of pushing the boundaries and the agenda, which we did since 2010 a lot. 2010 is the year in which uh, TB Reach uh, is, uh, was, the, was created. And I really wanna thank the government of Canada for the funding for TB Reach. And uh, is the year in which we started rolling the, this great platform 
uh, that uh, uh, you know, looks at funding innovative solutions, innovative ways of providing services for uh, people that are in uh, the biggest need to ensure access for them to diagnosis and treatment, starting with the people and funding projects that are based on local solutions. And I'm really proud to say that we are moving closer and closer to provide most of our funding just to structures and organizations that are from the high burden countries without funding that much uh, organizations from the big north, but growing the money to those that are in the biggest need and know the best what is needed uh, in their own countries. TB Reach is a great uh, is a great platform, and it's not that I'm saying this because it's obviously uh, a team uh, from Stop TB Partnership, but it's because uh, delivers uh, rapidly funding. Uh, and very solid monitoring and evaluation of projects that are shown to be proof of concepts for other bigger donors or domestic resources to go at scale and fund. And uh, TB Reach is the one that shows to the world that actually there is a huge demand in the TB community and there is a lot of ambition and desire to do and what is missing are a lot of other resources. And you know, just to, to tell you all, what made me completely uh, you know, surprised uh, was the fact that uh, the latest round that we launched for TB Reach, which came in this time of COVID, which was specifically for a subset of countries and for a subset of a technical area, MDR TB, which is not really something very uh, easy. We had more than 250 uh, applications requesting hundreds of millions of dollars in funding. And this is the perfect case to show that TB Reach has an incredible recognized value. And it shows as well that the TB community is keen to do much more if funding would have exist. Uh, which is the only platform that we have at the global level uh, for TB, but for other diseases as well, that is uh, able to move money extremely quickly and to see some of the results based on which we can see a scale up without having TB Reach, and I hope, based on what we've seen so far, hoping to have a TB Reach by 2030, we would have not been able to bring here some of the most amazing innovations that are either new tools, but also a specific way of delivering care. And I'm speaking here in terms of new tools, even for the gene expert, if you recall, there was a partnership created in which the, the, there was a combination of a hard and a soft uh, part that was needed in terms of the uh, for uh, when gene expert came on board there was a buy down sort of which is great you have the tool but will you have the people and then it was to be reached in that environment that was able to bring the people to be diagnosed and tested for gene expert as part of that starting in the year of 2010 and there are many many examples in terms of service delivery and involving the communities at ground level to develop their own local solutions, such as, as we know, the donkeys in Lesotho to the drones in Madagascar and to the transgender providing services for their own community in Pakistan. Some things uh, that, uh, you know, normally you don't see that much funded or you don't have too many people having the guts to go funded. funded. So I really hope that we will continue uh, in having the huge uh, energy uh, behind TB Reach Energy like energy, we will put that. We need as well the resources behind TB Reach uh, because uh, we will need uh, to showcase uh, with the help of local organizations, those that know the best their problem and their solutions to show that innovation is possible, to show that innovations will be hopefully cost efficient, those that will be tested and to be able to push the agenda forward. We are not in a good place with TB. COVID impacted us heavily, uh, 12 months of COVID turned us back 12 years. Uh, it's very difficult to digest this, but there is no time to stay and cry. It's time for some action. And if we are not able as a, as a world, as a community to understand that we, if we don't address this now, we will drag this thing after us for years, we will for sure pay later. But I am sure that we are much better than this, that we are smart and we will continue our investment in TV and in TV Reach. And I am grateful for you listening to me and thank you very much. Okay, 
So we have our marching orders, it's time to take action. Um, so it's important right now specifically to be asking Canada to maintain investment in TV reach because funding from Canada sunsets this March. So my computer's a bit slow, annoyingly, um, but my colleague is putting a link in the chat box right now to a very easy take action on social media as well in support of TV reach. So if we go to this user voice on social media, there is a tweet already pre-drafted right here that we can all just click on and it will open your Twitter account. Please do this with me. I'm, I'm, I'm asking you all to participate right now with me as that's loading. I'm also going to grab an image. You can just right click, copy the image and then go back into your Twitter and add it and hit the tweet out whenever you are ready. So I've already done that and I'm gonna hit tweet. Please do this with me, everyone. TB Reach's funding is sunsetting, as I said, this March, and we are a bit nervous that Canada will, well, we need to make sure that Canada maintains its funding because if it doesn't, there will be devastating consequences in lives lost to tuberculosis. And I think it would be a really cruel retrenchment of, of Canada's commitment to TB in the middle of a pandemic. So thank you so much for taking that action with me if you just did so. Um, we are actually right on time for, for wrapping up. I'm going to pass it over to Ashwin in a moment um, and you are all going to break out into smaller groups to have a bit of a discussion to reflect on the panel you just heard and also bending the arc if you if you watch that beforehand. If you want to take action alongside Stop to Be Canada, Partners in Health Canada, or Results Canada, stay tuned for um, a, an email coming to you tomorrow with a recording of this webinar with more information for, for how you can do that. We'd love to have you raise your voices alongside um, our organizations and the great work that, that we're all doing. So um, thank you once again. I'll pass it over to Ashwin and thank you to everybody who collaborated on the webinar with us this evening. It's been super fun to, to work alongside you. Ashwin, over to you. Yeah, I hope everyone's had a great time at this event. We will now be letting you into our breakout rooms to discuss the, uh, the actions that were just brought up, the Bending the Arc film and the panel discussion that just happened earlier. There will be a moderator in each room that will ask questions and help start you off. And you can let the conversation go from there if you wish to socialize more with other people and other like-minded individuals. We will keep them, uh, we'll be keeping them open so you can talk for as long as you wish. And if you feel like you have run the course of your conversation, you're definitely free to leave as well. Thanks so much for everyone for attending. And I think soon you should be getting your invitation for your breakout room. Yeah, um, everyone should be seeing a pop-up that would just allow them to join breakout room. If everyone can see that. If anyone has trouble, just let me just send a message or just let me know.